Okay, so um, good afternoon. So today we continue the discussion from yesterday and um, go on about, uh, in this case, uh, today the subject will be um, the thermal big bang and thermal relics. But first, I, um, I actually noticed yesterday that I didn't give you uh, references. So um, here I, uh, I just give you as a start, um, a couple of uh, references that can be useful. And I will start with a couple of books. Um, there are, of course, historical books. Uh, and one I still uh, like a lot is uh, the book by Kolb and Turner, which is called The Early Universe. which is still, I think, a very good book, especially for um, the WIMP mechanism and uh, uh, the thermal uh, Big Bang. Um, and um, this is, uh, in some senses, uh, already a few years old, but uh, still uh, quite a good uh, reference. And then uh, for the part on structure formation, uh, the perturbation, which I discussed uh, shortly uh, yesterday, I actually based the discussion uh, on the book by Mukhanov. Uh, so I give it to you um, here. It's of course uh, much uh, more than what I discussed yesterday. Uh, so, uh, but just so that you have at least a, re a reference. And this one is Cambridge University Press. Uh, and it is from 2005. Uh, sorry, here I have to move a little bit. Let me see if I can. Uh, no. Yes. Okay, um, so these one are books. Um, so, uh, and these, of course, contain much more material than what I discussed yesterday and we'll discuss today and the rest of the lectures, but uh, they can be useful to, to give you uh, uh, also more information about the genetically particle cosmology. And uh, then I, for the dark matter part, I would suggest uh, two reviews, which are connected to um, Fuzzy lectures. Uh, so this one is uh, from, from Pong Yan Lin. That is a Fuzzy lectures on dark matter model and direct detections. I don't write all the title is long. I give you the archive, archive number. Uh, that's uh, the advantage that you can just uh, download it from the archive. 1904-07915. And another reference which can be uh, also useful for tomorrow. Um, that is by Tracy Slater. Also other Tazi lectures of a couple of years before. And these are lectures on indirect detection of dark matter. And this is the archive number 1710. I'm sorry, I can't write. I don't know what's the problem. Why do I do that? Okay, so this one is already uh, probably useful for you to check a few things and to um, look at many more details, of course, that I will be able to cover. Okay, um, so for today, um, I would like to start just a very, very shortly to um, make a summary uh, on the uh, characteristic that our matter has to have. So that are the dark matter properties. 
So yesterday, maybe I didn't distress those uh, very much, uh, but uh, let me put here a kind of list or wish list. The dark matter should be dark. So what does it mean dark? Uh, so that means uh, very weak uh, or no interaction with photons. So, so if you want to know light emission or absorption. So uh, practically, uh, they, it doesn't really have to be zero, the coupling, but it has to be very small. So uh, let's say suppressed coupling to protons. Okay, so this one is already uh, the important uh, characteristic, which is also in the name. Uh, this is why we call it a dark matter. The second characteristic is uh, that it has to be decoupled uh, from the uh, primordial plasma. So I write here the coupled. And what is I do I mean the coupled? This is a discussion we did at the end yesterday. The fact that you uh, can in sustain produce and uh, make the um, perturbation grow in dark matter. Um, and they can grow only because the dark matter doesn't have any pressure. So um, in that sense, if you consider dark matter as a fluid in the cosmological evolution, it does really have to be uh, non-relativistic and um, has no coupling to the thermal plasma, which for example, instead has a pressure until, um, uh, until it's coupled to the photons, in particular, uh, until the epoch where the cosmic microwave background uh, decouples from the baryons. So this is, uh, uh, means decoupled uh, from, uh, from the plasma. And this is because you need sufficient time for this uh, perturbation we discussed yesterday to grow. And if the dark matter instead remains coupled uh, to the plasma, this is delayed until, um, until really the plasma becomes more relativistic. And then a third property, uh, which you could uh, argue about, but I will assume it, um, it's the fact that I will take uh, dark matter to be non-baryonic. And uh, this is uh, the uh, main um, reason for that, of course, is that we know that the um, density of baryons, uh, so omega baryon as measured by the cosmic microwave background, is less uh, than the uh, dark matter density. And also, again, in some sense, it's connected also to the point above, uh, the fact if you would have a really um, dark matter made of baryons, it's very difficult to make them uh, decoupled from uh, photons or from other interaction of the standard model. Of course, there are uh, some possible candidates when you think you could uh, do it, uh, for example, of course, there have been in the uh, old days the proposal, for example, that you had also additional dark baryons uh, um, and also the fact that if you form com combined object like machos or, of course, uh, primordial black holes, uh, then, of course, uh, those baryons uh, in, in this bounded object will not really um, take part uh, in, the, in the evolution like uh, the normal uh, baryonic plasma. But I will disregard that, um, that case and uh, assuming uh, again that the number of baryons is exactly what we measure from the cosmic microwave background and uh, nucleosynthesis uh, and therefore it is in any case not enough to make up the whole dark matter. And then a fourth characteristic um, is that it has to be cold and the cold means uh, cold enough so this is again connected to the structure formation. Uh, I didn't discuss it very much in detail yesterday, but um, the point is that you need for, in order for this, again, for this structure to form and the perturbation to grow on all scales, you need that this free streaming length uh, of the dark matter is sufficiently small. So this maybe we'll, we will have a discussion next week in the lecture about neutrinos uh, on the fact that neutrinos instead, for example, can be a hot dark matter component. 
And in that case, they have a non-trivial free streaming length uh, so that uh, the structure formation would be different and uh, you would have uh, uh, the perturbation on the uh, scale, um, which is uh, of the order, for example, of uh, galaxy, they would not be able to grow. So in that sense, uh, we need instead a particle which uh, has a very, very small free streaming length. And then there is a fifth characteristic, which I put here, uh, it has to be stable or very long lived. And this, of course, is because dark matter is still uh, around. So uh, we, we find them in the galaxy, in the clusters, as we saw yesterday. So this particle is not that we just need it uh, at the beginning during the uh, cosmological evolution, but we need it to be present also today. So, of course, if the lifetime is very long, you, we could have lost a little bit of dark matter in the meantime, but this um, quantity of dark matter we could have lost, uh, it's actually pretty small. And tomorrow uh, we will discuss a bit more in detail uh, limits also on this uh, lifetime. Okay, so this one are a little bit the characteristic we want uh, to look for, for a dark matter candidate. <laughs> Is there any question? Okay. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, I, mean, I have actually one. Sorry, can I ask? Yes, please. Uh, uh, we essentially we require that there is no coupling with photon or small coupling for dark matter. But uh, and uh, what about the, for example, the strong part of the standard model group or the weak part? Well, the weak part is possible, and this we will discuss also more in detail tomorrow. Uh, the weak interaction is not completely uh, excluded. It's actually uh, this uh, WIMP mechanism, the W comes exactly uh, from weak. Uh, regarding the strong interaction, um, this is a little bit more problematic. At Again, a uh, strong interaction would point, uh, first of all, towards baryonic uh, dark matter in some sense. And secondly, if the cross-section starts to become too large, then uh, you can start to have, uh, again, effects um, that you observe also in the, in the baryonic sector, like uh, bounding bounded states. And then you could have, again, the possibility, for example, to have um, um, to, 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 to be able to um, emit or absorb energy from, uh, from not only from photons, but also, for example, um, uh, for, from scatterings. And in that case, you would have a dissipating type of dark matter. So actually, this is another characteristic I should add here, non-dissipative. And uh, if you have a dark matter type which is able to emit energy and dissipate energy, then the problem is that this type of dark matter would behave like a baryon, and which means, for example, in galactic evolution or in, in cluster evolution, you would tend to concentrate in the center because it would just, uh, uh, if you have a potential well, uh, a gravitational potential well, you are able to uh, get rid of kinetic energy in favor of uh, some other form of energy, and then uh, you are you're falling down into the center of the uh, potential well. Okay, and this is not what we observe, or at least not what we want for dark matter, because as we saw in the case of galaxies, the dark matter density remains substantial even far away from the center. And one way to explain that is to, to really have this non-dissipative uh, characteristic. Of course, there are also um, uh, exceptions. Uh, so tomorrow, if I have time, I will also discuss, there are also a uh, proposal instead to use um, strongly interacting dark matter or dark matter with uh, slightly different properties. Um, in that case, uh, this could, uh, could help against uh, some um, problems that people uh, think that are present in the case of the, for example, the center of the galaxy, this uh, famous problem about uh, the fact that we have a cusp or a core. Um, this, if I have time, I will discuss briefly uh, tomorrow. So it's not an absolute uh, necessary uh, step. You could, uh, you could live in some sense with some, um, with some interaction, which is not, uh, not so weak. Uh, but usually not exactly the one uh, connected to QCD. In some sense, the QCD coupling, um, it's, um, it's probably a bit too strong for that, uh, for that purpose. 
So I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, thanks a lot. Okay. So at the moment, then, I will go from the simplest possibility. I will assume that it's a particle um, that is, uh, um, I will see it in a minute, actually, that will not have absolutely coupling uh, to photons, but probably also no QCD couplings. Okay, so this is what we will look for. And I hope until uh, the end of the lecture to get to uh, show you that there is one uh, very good candidate, which actually fits also all these characteristics. Now, um, this was a little bit the summary, but now let me go uh, to uh, the other uh, important uh, part of cosmology, which yesterday we did not discuss. And this is, uh, in some sense, the thermal Big Bang. And to get to thermal relics. So yesterday we discussed uh, the behavior of the background, uh, but in some sense we describe the matter and the radiation in the universe just as fluid, uh, so without any uh, particular model for it. And uh, now we want to go a little bit more in detail, and in particular we want to have a kind of uh, thermodynamical description of that fluid. And um, we we know uh, so what what we know. So it's, for example, uh, the, um, so we have a photon background, so the CMB, uh, with the thermal spectrum. And this is exactly what I showed also uh, last yesterday in uh, one of the slides. We have a practically a perfect Planck spectrum from the cosmic microwave background with a temperature of 2.7 uh, Kelvin. And in that sense, uh, the, in order to explain the presence of that, uh, of that uh, background with such a, a, uh, a thermal spectrum, the conclusion is that uh, th there was a time where there was a, a plasma in equilibrium. So uh, the idea is here that you have a local equilibrium. So, so key concept is local equilibrium, local thermal equilibrium. So this means uh, more in detail uh, that we can assume that um, the interactions were fast enough to produce in every point of the universe uh, an equilibrium state. And the other assumption is also that the expansion of the universe was uh, slow enough in such that uh, this thermalization process uh, was always efficient and was in some sense um, always having a thermal state which was slowly tracking uh, the change, if you want, in the temperature. And the change in temperature has to happen due to the expansion of the universe. So this one, I will come to that in a minute. So, um, so what does it mean thermal equilibrium? So um, if you want thermal equilibrium has two components. Um, you have usually the what is called kinetic equilibrium. And this is uh, due to, uh, if you want, uh, elastic scattering as well, but not only, of course. This means that you are uh, exchanging energy between the particles in such a way that uh, the distribution, if you want, is such that is exactly a a thermal distribution, but you have also another uh, important contribution or part of thermal equilibrium, which is what is called chemical equilibrium. And chemical equilibrium is instead uh, connected uh, to the uh, equilibrium among different species. So it is uh, usually connected uh, to inelastic scattering. And uh, this is exactly what we will uh, later on uh, analyze in detail. 
uh, the fact uh, that we could have, for example, kinetic equilibrium, uh, but uh, go out of chemical equilibrium uh, in such a way that we fix, in some sense, the number of particles of a particular species, but they remain, in some sense, with a thermal spectrum, even if they are uh, out of chemical equilibrium. So this is exactly what we think um, could have happened and what we know has happened for cert certain particles. Okay. So uh, if we want to describe a particle in thermal equilibrium, um, what the key quantity, of course, is uh, the phase space distribution. Well, actually, also, if you want to describe it outside of equilibrium, of course. So we have the distribution of particles in phase space as a function of the momentum and the uh, space in principle, and of course, in principle, the time. So this is what we use usually in statistical mechanics uh, to describe uh, um, an ensemble of particles. And this gives us practically the density of the particles in a cell in phase space uh, around a particular momentum P and around a particular space X. Of course, this description, we can now, um, if you want, um, make more precise for our uh, particular case. Uh, so uh, we know that in cosmology, we have a homogeneous and uh, and isotropic universe to start with. So this means uh, that uh, if we uh, assume uh, that the phase space uh, distribution will actually not depend on the X variable, or if you want, you can again uh, expand it with a kind of uh, homogeneous and isotropic part which will not depend on the coordinate x. Then, of course, in principle, uh, this we will not do today. But in principle, you could also add, again, a, a fluctuation around it or a perturbation, which could instead depend on x. But uh, yeah, this is also what one does, for example, for the cosmic microwave photons. But we will not actually look at that uh, for the dark matter, uh, because at the moment, uh, the important thing would be to really uh, have a um, um, a prediction for the number density of the particle and not uh, just uh, these uh, small fluctuations around it. So uh, this is, as I said, this is in sense, um, it's again uh, as the same assumption we did for the cosmology so that we will have just a distribution uh, function which depends only on the momentum and on time and not on, um, on the space. So once we have this function, of course, then we can compute actually everything, also the thermodynamic quantities we discussed yesterday, like the density and the pressure. So uh, I can give you then uh, the, the formulas. It's uh, pretty simple. It's the usual thing as in statistical mechanics. We can define a number density of particle as a function of time, just by integrating, so multiplying, of course, with a factor G, which is the number of internal degrees of freedom, and then integrating in the uh, momentum. OK, so this one is, as usual, just the number density of the particle, which in this case would depend only on time. And G, as I said, is uh, the internal, uh, the number of internal degrees of freedom. And for example, for a particle of spin uh, one, it's uh, uh, massless, it's uh, two. Or uh, for a, a spin one half particle, uh, it depends if it is a fermion, uh, it's a Dirac fermion or a Majorana fermion, you can have either two or four degrees of freedom. Now, this is the number density. And then, of course, we can, uh, in similar way, compute also the other quantities we discussed um, previously. So I will uh, write, actually, um, the expression for the density. It's clear that the density, the energy density, is, again, g, the integral in the uh, momentum of uh, the energy for the single particle as a function of the momentum. and the distribution in momentum. 
And uh, similarly, we can also write the pressure. And you can, I think, uh, easily uh, convince yourself the pressure is connected to a P square divided by three times the energy. And this formula, you can see also immediately that uh, this formula in the case of a relativistic, uh, relati so let me go to the relativistic case, relativistic particle. Then we have, of course, that uh, the energy is practically the momentum plus a small correction. I can write the expansion. And uh, therefore, you see immediately that um, in this case, uh, P and rho are related. Uh, here, P squared over 3E is nothing else as uh, one, uh, one third of the energy, if you want. Uh, so we have automatically that P is equal to one third rho. So this is exactly uh, the case where with W, the factor we introduced yesterday is equal to one third, which is the general um, case for a relativistic particle. But of course, we can apply this formula also for non-relativistic particle. And in that case, uh, things are different. We have, uh, for example, that then the energy is mostly coming from the mass. And here I'm using units where C is equal to one. Sorry, I forgot, of course, uh, C and H bar are one. So I don't have any here, MC square. And uh, it's clear that then we have that the density uh, rho is just the mass times the number density. So in that sense, it's uh, number density or the de energy density are the same apart from the factor of a mass. And uh, secondly, the pressure in this case, it's very much suppressed because we have uh, this integral in d3 p of uh, p squared d, uh, again divided by three, en uh, uh, three energy and energy is actually the mass if you want we can also put here the mass and this is actually uh, practically zero because p squared over m is is a small uh, quantity so you can, in principle, if you want, uh, uh, compute it explicitly, but this uh, is, uh, is mostly practically suppressed. So it's uh, well approximated uh, with zero. And this gives us uh, the famous result that P is equal to zero. So uh, the um, equation of state W is in this case zero. Okay, so you see that we can describe uh, through these expressions both the relativistic and the non-relativistic case. Now, of course, we also know what the distribution function has to be in equilibrium or, um, yeah, so we have, um, so in thermal equilibrium, we know what uh, the, this distribution has to be. We have, of course, either the Fermi Dirac or the Bose Einstein di distribution, which is, uh, so let me call it here equilibrium. This is one over the exponential of uh, E minus mu divided by T plus or minus one. And of course, plus one for the Fermi, minus one for the Bose distribution. Here, mu is a new quantity you can introduce. Mu is the chemical potential. And this is usually related to a conserved uh, quantity. No, sorry.
So um, in particular, um, you can have, in the case of relativistic particle, of course, you could have a conserved uh, quantum number, like a charge or, or the baryon number or the lepton number or things like that. In the non-relativistic case, actually, usually what you have as a conservation is already a conservation of the number of particle or the mass, if you want. So usually non-relativistic particles, um, of course, uh, they can decay, so they could also, uh, but if they are stable, they, then you would have a conservation uh, of the number of particles. Now, uh, this quantity mu allows you also to distinguish between particles and antiparticles, and this would be uh, exactly in the relativistic case. So in particular, I can give you just directly the expression, what is if you want the number of particle minus number of antiparticles, then of course I would have to do the uh, integral. And here I have the factors of pi explicitly. Um, I have the integral, I can write it as an integral in energy from the mass m to infinity of the uh, momenta. So I have an e square minus m square one half. I have a factor of e times the difference in the two distribution. And here, if I plug in the equilibrium one, then I have the expression I had before, and I can uh, write uh, more simply, I have two pi square, I have to gain the integral, sorry, no, this is not zero, is of course again m, And I have e, this, the usual factors, the e square minus m square. And this, uh, this uh, difference between the two, I can rewrite actually as, as a ratio. And it is uh, practically uh, twice uh, sine hyperbolicus of mu over t times uh, e to the e over t plus e to the minus e over t plus or minus twice the cos hyperbolicus of mu over t. So you just use the formula I gave you before and you just compute it. Of course, uh, sorry, I forgot to say, of course, the, the sine of mu in f of p bar so here, uh, the sign of mu changes for particle and antiparticle, okay? So let me write it here. So particle, antiparticle, plus or minus mu, okay? So this is exactly distinguishing between the particle and the antiparticle density. Uh, sorry. Ooh. Ah, yes, here. So this was the formula. And if you do uh, this expression here, you can do the expansion in different limits. Uh, you see immediately that if you do the expansion for uh, the case where the temperature is very high with respect to uh, mu and the mass, then what you get out is uh, to lowest order something like uh, g over 6 pi squared t cubed and the first term is a pi square mu over t. So you see that this is a plus other terms, which I'm not writing here, but you see then in that sense, the difference between particle and antiparticle is exactly connected to this mu parameter, so the chemical potential. On the other hand, you can also look at the other uh, limit where you go to the non-relativistic limit with small temperature, and then you get um, another uh, result, which I, give you here. If I take t much smaller than mu and the mass, then you get something like 2g, you get a mass times temperature over 2 pi to the 3 halves, and then you have a sinus hyperbolicus of mu over t, e to the minus m over t. So you see immediately that if you go uh, to temperature which are much smaller than the mass, for example, uh, you have a suppression here, this exponential suppression. 
which is connected in some sense uh, to uh, a Boltzmann suppression of uh, these uh, number of particles. And moreover, of course, uh, if you um, you have here also dependence uh, mu t uh, to the three half that we will find out again later on. Of course, this is the density for the difference between particle and antiparticle. You can also uh, see that uh, the, a similar limit you can take for the number of particle and antiparticle separately, and you would get, uh, in that sense, uh, not more that depends on mu, but uh, more this exponential suppression uh, would, uh, would show up again, and we will find it again later on. Okay, so from these formulas, of course, we can compute very easily what is um, the total density, for example, of all relativistic species. So if you want, uh, that is again density of relativistic species. Mela. So this uh, is exactly, if you want, the row in radiation. And you can sum up uh, all contributions. So um, of course, it's again the sum over all species of these uh, of the integrals I had before. Let me go back. Oh, sorry, I jumped a page. Why did I jump a page? OK, uh, I will sort it out later. Um, OK, so this one is the density uh, generically. But of course, here I have a distribution for every species. And uh, it, depending here, if I have a fermion or a bosons, I would have a different uh, distribution. So I can separate bosons and fermions. And in this case, I will also assume that there is no chemical potential, just for simplicity. Okay. So, that, so for mu is equal to 0. So we have a radiation density, uh, which will be uh, the sum over all uh, baryons. For the baryons, I have, again, um, the uh, factor p squared over 30. I have the internal number of degrees of freedom. And I have, in principle, uh, temperature uh, to the fourth. And the temperature to the four dependence you gain, uh, of course, from the integral. You can see it immediately here. Uh, here, if uh, the, the distribution function would depend mostly on E over T. So you can rescale all these integral uh, 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 with variables which are uh, we have no dimension. So if you divide the energy by T, you divide the momentum by T. And you see immediately that here you have three powers of the momenta, one power of the energy, so you get a t to the fourth in front. And that's exactly what it is here. And the rest is nothing else as the numerical integration of uh, this uh, expression, which gives you this pi square over 30. And similarly, for uh, the uh, fermions, you can have, uh, um, in this case, you have an additional 7 over 8. And you have a pi square over 30 again. So in some sense, the integral in this case of the Fermi distribution is slightly different as the integral of the Bose distribution, but not much. You have again the internal degrees of freedom, and they have the temperature again to the fourth power. And now, of course, with these uh, together, we can also put it all together. We can write it as a pi square over 30, a kind of G star which is the sum over these, uh, or these degrees of freedom times t to the fourth. And this g star is nothing else as the sum. Uh, so g star is equal to the sum over bosons of uh, gi, if you want, ti over t to the fourth, plus the sum over fermions of the same thing, uh, plus the 78, of course. OK, sorry. Here I can't write. Apparently, I am too far away. Um, so I hope it's uh, clear what it is. I um, Yeah, so this one is uh, the definition of G star. I can rewrite it if you want. OK, since I have um, 
yeah, let me go to the next slide and rewrite it. This is an important quantity because we will use it uh, a few times. This is practically, again, the sum over i on the degrees of freedom, the bosons, sorry, the bosons, the degrees of freedom, ti over t to the fourth power. Here, of course, I am taking uh, also this in, uh, in account because I could have different species at different temperature. And here I have a kind of global temperature T, which is uh, the, if you want, the, te the temperature of the dominant component of the bat. And then you have a sum over fermions of uh, apart from the seven, eight, exactly the same degrees of freedom. Let me call them J here. And then I have Tj over T again to the fourth power. And uh, this quantity is important because it's also those that enters also in the Friedman equation. If you remember the Hubble parameter, so H square, I can rewrite it uh, as a function of uh, the density. Uh, and in this sense, uh, if I plug in exactly these uh, densities of thermal Rally of thermal bath of particles and the relativistic part, assuming this is the dominant contribution, I get exactly uh, the following formula. Of a T to the fourth. So you see that this gives me a dependence on the Hubble parameter on the temperature of the thermal bath. And indeed, I can compute also explicitly if I take the, the square root, if you want, this is nothing else. I can rewrite things here a little bit in a different way. I can uh, cancel out a few factors and I can get a, a pi over three, which is easy to remember and it is order one. I have also, I get a factor G star over 10 at one half, which is usually also something over the one because G star for certain, certain epoch of the, uni, uh, the history of the universe is around 10, but it can be also lower or larger, of course. And then you have a T square over uh, the reduced Planck scale. So in some sense, you're always comparing uh, T with the Planck scale. And this is exactly the, um, the thing which, um, which you obtain. Um, in some sense, the Hubble parameter is always um, smaller, if you want, than the temperature, the scale of the Hubble parameter. Now, this one, if you uh, had solved the, the expression for the um, matter uh, or radiation domination, you see that this one, the Hubble parameter is always 1 over t. And actually, in this case, uh, you have it, um, if you want, it's 1 over uh, 2 times the time. So from this relation, you could also see a relation between the time and the temperature, uh, which you can uh, easily, if you want, uh, invert. And uh, if you want to um, have an order of magnitude idea, you get that the uh, time is approximately, so this is 1.45 seconds. So this is a point times uh, 1 MeV divided the temperature squared. So this gives you a little bit an order of magnitude how the temperature and the um, and the time evolve uh, here, of course, for fixed uh, G star. Okay. Now, uh, this is what regards the energy density, but of course there is another quantity which in thermodynamics is very, very useful, um, which is the entropy. And the entropy, and especially the entropy density, it's also very useful in this case, uh, because uh, we can assume that the expansion of the universe is an adiabatic process. So if you want, there is no way that you can really exchange uh, entropy from outside the universe. So in that sense, um, the entropy is conserved within, uh, within any part of the universe. There are, of course, a few epochs in the history of the universe where that does not hold. Uh, for example, if you have a particle which is not relativistic, which decays, uh, this produces, in some sense, uh, entropy. So um, in that case, you cannot really assume that you have a conservation of entropy. 
But assuming that um, for, for most uh, of the uh, history of the universe, one can assume a, a, what is called a diabatic expansion. And this means that if you want the uh, entropy in total is conserved, and the entropy is nothing else as the entropy density, which I also denote with S. So let me use here another S. Let me use here the, this S as a second. And here is the entropy S. So this is the entropy density times, of course, uh, the scale factor, which we, uh, the, to the cube, which correspond to the volume. And this is, uh, if you want, constant. And in that sense, uh, through this relation, we can uh, see how the, um, the temperature changes with the expansion of the universe. So, and in principle, uh, we'll see in a minute, but the entropy will be dependent on the temperature cubed. So you will have that the temperature cube times the uh, scale factor cubed are constant, which means the temperature will drop like one over the scale factor. And in that sense, this is exactly what I was saying that we assume you have local equilibrium uh, which tracks uh, the expansion of the universe. And for doing now, uh, we need of course to define what is the entropy and uh, to, uh, to get what is the entropy, we can use uh, the um, second law of the thermodynamic. So we have the usual formula, TDS is equal to the change in energy plus the work done by the pressure. And if you want uh, this one, you can also rewrite it. The energy here is nothing else as uh, the uh, density of the energy times the volume. And then uh, we have again a PdV, which means if you want, you can rewrite it as D um, rho plus PV minus V dP. Okay, so this is in some sense the differential of the, uh, of the entropy. Now, uh, you have also to use an other relation in particular for this dp. This relation is connected to this Maxwell relation of the thermodynamics. Uh, I'm not going to, to derive it here. Um, I can do it in the discussion tonight or, or um, uh, yeah, so you ask me about it later if you want. But what you want can show is that you, if you want, you have that dp is actually equal to rho plus p over t dt. And if you use this uh, as a result in this expression, what at the end comes out is that you can write the entropy very simply as a function of uh, rho plus p over t v. And now, of course, if you bring the V on the other side and you drop it from here, you obtain exactly the entropy density. The entropy density is nothing else as the energy density plus the pressure density divided by the temperature. And in that sense, this is exactly the relation we need to see uh, what is the entropy density. So we obtain the result, the famous result that we have the rho plus P over T. And this means um, that if you want, this goes like T to the, uh, you can rewrite it as a G star S often called a T cube. Now the G star F S um, also has, uh, let me check. I have also a few uh, constants here, which I dropped. Uh, let me check if I find it. Uh, 
Well, it is actually in the exercise sheet that you probably will see later on. So, um, okay, I don't find it immediately, but uh, I will give it to you, to you later. Yeah, of course, here you have also some constants uh, that you have to keep track of. They are usually not included in this G star. Okay. Uh, but uh, this is the important uh, relation. Why? Because, of course, it means again that you have uh, this entropy connected to the uh, energy density and the pressure. So you see immediately that for a relativistic species, we have here a P is one third of rho. So we have S is, is exactly equal to four thirds rho over T. And in that sense, it is always a, a, a large quantity, uh, if you want. If instead, if you go to the non-relativistic case, we have S is equal to, uh, here P would be practically zero. Rho is actually M over N divided by T. And here, you, I mean, if you compute n, you see that n goes like t cubed uh, divided by t. So this one is something which goes like m t square, which is usually as long as you have, uh, if you have a particle which is, um, in that sense, it's it has a completely different behavior as uh, the one uh, in the relativistic case. And usually it is usual to, um, if you want to neglect uh, the, uh, the entropy in the non-relativistic species, especially because here it is practically blocked by a mass. So in that sense, it's not really uh, uh, um, entropy connected with, um, with the freedom of particles or uh, the, the way uh, how you have the distribution in momenta. But uh, in this case, in a sense, the energy density is mostly uh, just uh, the uh, the mass uh, and the the in some sense the rest mass and the re rest energy of the particle. So usually it's uh, neglected. Okay, so this one is a little bit the um, the idea how to. Um, describe a little bit thermodynamic quantities. I see that I am already quite, uh, yeah, so I'm a bit slow probably today, um, but I could stop here for questions and then I will start to go more in detail about uh, describing particles which are not in thermal equilibrium. Of course, at the moment I was always assuming the equilibrium distribution. So are there any questions? Thank you, Laura. You have already on the chat three questions, so. Probably you can answer. Yes, let me see if I can see the chat. Uh, so if, if you like, of course, I can read it. And yeah, I'll... I think it would be easier because if I, I think I have to stop sharing. I don't okay, see. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Uh, so I'm going to read it. Yeah. So the first one is from Samuel Sanchez Lopez. Maybe he would like also to ask you again the question. But in any case, the question is, do these magnitudes depends on the momentum or just on the momentous magnitude? due to isotropy. So it's something referring to the beginning of the lecture. Um, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, this will be another simplification we will do later on. Indeed, at the end, the direction of the momentum will not be important due to isotropy. So here we will also drop the dependence on the direction. That's correct. We will uh, discuss it when I, uh, yeah, I want to discuss it when I uh, really uh, describe the Boltzmann equation, but it's true. So thanks. The second one is from Guillermo Franco Abellian. He's going to say, is the assumption mu equal to zero, zero chemical potential, always a good approximation? Uh, no, of course not. For the baryons, uh, for example, at a certain point, uh, you need to have a mu, take into account the mu different from zero because you have a baryon number of the universe. And similarly also for the leptons, um, you, we assume, or we, we of course don't know exactly what the lepton number of the universe is, but we assume that these uh, numbers are of the same order. So if you would uh, uh, stick to having mu equal to zero, if you look at here, you would have actually zero baryon number or very, very small baryon number today. So if you want to describe instead the present baryon number, you need to keep uh, the uh, chemical potential different from zero. 
fine. And the third one is from Alessio Focardi. If mu equal to zero, how may, how may have t very uh, much smaller than mu? Uh, you mean in which limit? Let me get to the slide. So I did understand the question. So is if mu is equal to zero, how may we have a temperature much smaller than mu? In this relation, you mean? Uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I, I think it should be this one. But in this relation, of course, I'm kicking in u not equal to zero. But, uh, and if I would put here mu to equal to zero, you see, seen if hyperbolicals will give you zero. So this means exactly that the number of particle and number of antiparticle would be exactly equal uh, to each other. Uh, but of course, I can take the approximation for the number density instead of the difference of number density. So I could, uh, let me go back. So here I am taking the difference of the number density, but I can take instead the limit for the number density of particle and not uh, the, the, the difference of particle minus antiparticle. And in that case, what happens, uh, I can just say it, it's uh, just that you don't have this uh, sinus hyperbolicus here. Because uh, these, of course, would, uh, uh, if you want, uh, would correspond to the case where you don't have any chemical potential to start with uh, in the um, here. Sorry. Yeah, you can put here mu equal to zero from the start and compute just the, the number density of particles and not the number density of antiparticles. Fine. And then from Christian Schmidt, for which epoch of the universe and for which particle species? Is the assumption of thermal equilibrium typically valid? Uh, yes, this we will go and look in more in detail in the in the next part of the lecture. Of course, um, usually we have in the standard model quite large couplings. So I will give you in a minute uh, really the uh, condition uh, which uh, sets uh, when things are in equilibrium, where they are not in equilibrium. And this, of course, is the comparison of the rates with the Hubble parameter. So um, we will assume that locally we can have thermal equilibrium as long as rates for a particular process are fast enough compare in comparison to the expansion of the universe. Okay, thanks. We have no more written questions and maybe there are some new one. I, don't know. Uh, I have one question. Uh, for this page, uh, um, at, at, the, <clears throat> at the every, uh, every uh, uh, different uh, uh, particle have different uh, temperature at the uh, right uh, lower corner. Yeah. Yes. Or, yeah. The, does this mean, uh, I mean, if, uh, if different particles have different uh, temperature, it means it's decoupled from the, the best, right? No, they can be decoupled with the, from each other, but they can form two different baths or three different baths, or, or you can think about different uh, possibilities. We, we will see one case in a minute. Um, this, for example, is connected to, with the neutrinos. And I guess you will probably discuss it also more in detail next week. But I will, I will derive it in a minute. Uh, for example, the neutrinos stay in equilibrium with the photons up to a certain point or with electrons. And then at the, they will decouple. And then you have, in some sense, two separate uh, plasma or two separate thermal baths, if you want, the neutrinos on one side and the photons and the electrons on the other side. So if there are different uh, thermal baths, I, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, what's the uh, T means? It's uh, what's the temperature of the T, not Ti? Well, the T here I have defined it is the temperature which is related to the dominant, if you want. Uh, well, this expression is always correct. You see that there is always a one over T here to the fourth, so you cancel exactly. So the expression here is valid for any definition of, on, on my T here. Uh, the T without index. On the other hand, of course, it's uh, more useful to use here a temperature uh, either that you know well or that it is the dominant component uh, in the energy density of the universe. So in many purposes in cosmology, we use the photon temperature, of course, as a kind of uh, very, very well-known uh, parameter or at least uh, a temperature which we, we, we also have already measured now and uh, we just started it backward. Okay, can you go to next page? Yes. Oh, next. Uh, next, sorry. Uh, next. Okay, this, uh, if, if I remember correctly, I, 
I remember there is another, uh, I mean, there is a, um, a Boltzmann suppression factor for the, for the non-relative. Uh, 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 yes, right? uh, you're, yes, yes, you're correct. Uh, sorry, here I'm using the number density. I use the number density in the relativistic case, which of course is wrong. Yes, sorry, you are completely correct. Yes, so actually this one is exactly yeah, this one is exactly the expression I had before. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, that's exactly why I did highlight it. So here you, you obtain exactly the number density divided the temperature uh, as uh, in comparison, or if you want, uh, let me write it like this. Here you have M over T. And you can take, uh, sorry, the, um, the expression which I had here, where you, in some sense, you can forget about the sinus hyperbolicus, and this gives you the limit of the number density. Yes, you're correct. So you have here, let me get back if I am able to. Yes, here you have mt uh, over, uh, what was it at the uh, three half e to the minus m over t. And some p factors, which I probably forgot or the g star actually. Yes, so there is a two pi here and a, a factor G. Yeah, and here, of course, the factor, the number of degrees of freedom, so the G. Yes, uh, you are completely correct. So that is, uh, um, and it's uh, evident due to this exponential suppression that the, this entropy is actually um, uh, small and therefore right. negligible. Uh, yes, another question. Can you can you repeat uh, what is the relation of the capital T to the TIs? Uh, I think it will become clearer in the discussion in a minute. Uh, but here I am, in some sense, taking out a T to the fourth in this uh, expression for the radiation density. So I am assuming here, or at least it's convenient here to take T as the temperature of the dominant component of the energy density. But uh, in principle, this expression I'm writing here as always divided by T to the fourth. This means that in principle, uh, it's corrected for, you can choose even a, some reference temperature if you prefer. Okay, so- So uh, the TI could be the maximum, so it's the maximum of the TIs or it could be any other of the TIs? Exactly, yes. Okay. Of course, as I said, it's sometimes convenient to choose a temperature you know well, for example, the photon temperature, uh, but uh, you could also choose the neutrino temperature if you want, or you could choose uh, any other particle temperature. And the expression is still re remains valid because here you're rescaling everything always by T. Okay, is it all? Yeah, there are no more written questions, so. Okay, good. Then I think I will go on because uh, otherwise I will not, will not get to the interesting part. <laughs> this one, of course, it was all in equilibrium. Now we will, when we want to consider the case of uh, where we have a particle out of equilibrium. So what does it mean? That is exactly what uh, you asked me. So, uh, that is exactly condition for equilibrium. And this, as I told you, is uh, the, the, if you want the rate with which I have to compare anything is uh, the rate of expansion of the universe. Because of course, if a process uh, happens faster, then I can really in some sense readjust the temperature to the expansion. If this process happens too slow compared to the, um, to the expansion of the universe, uh, you are not able to really uh, have this uh, adiabatic uh, um, um, adapting if you want to the new temperature. So the, uh, the uh, condition is usually gamma for a particular process has to be larger or much larger than the Hubble parameter. The Hubble parameter, if you re remember, is the, exactly the rate of change of the uh, scale factor. 
And for the um, for the case, of course, of the um, if we we know that the change the rate of change of the scale factor since we have we have seen it for the adiabatic expansion. We have uh, T uh, in principle G star S. So again, uh, these always considering that the number of degrees of freedom doesn't change, but let me be more uh, precise and uh, write it um, completely also considering the, the, the number of degrees of freedom. So I have G star S T cube A cube is equal constant. This means that uh, if you want for G star, if you assume that the number of degrees of freedom is constant, then you have just that T goes like one over A. And then it's uh, clear that if you take uh, the, uh, the rate of change of the temperature, so T dot over T, it would be equal uh, in uh, absolute value as A dot over A. Okay, and uh, in that sense, uh, this will also be related, therefore, to the rate of change of the um, of the temperature. So um, you see that, uh, therefore, you have um, yeah. So you can compute it directly from here. You get the t dot uh, is equal to uh, well, one over a square with a minus sign a dot, and uh, this is exactly uh, minus uh, t a dot over a. Okay, so this means that the uh, if you have a, an adiabatic expansion, you assume uh, you would see that the temperature changes at most like the, the Hubble parameter, and therefore you need the rates to be faster than that in order to follow uh, the change in temperature due to the expansion of the universe. And uh, that is exactly this uh, condition that I'm writing here. Okay. Of course, if you have also a change in the number of degrees of freedom, then things get a bit more complicated. So here, for example, you could have uh, that G decreases, and this is usually what happens because particles uh, become non-relativistic, so they go out from the uh, count uh, in the entropy. And in this case, if you lose a G star, then you see that you have to, in some sense, uh, push up the temperature here in order to compensate. So there are epochs of the universe when the temperature actually uh, decreases lower than the Hubble parameter. Uh, but nevertheless, these are particular epochs. And, and you have also times where, you, in some sense, you can transfer entropy from one sector or the other. And then you can also have different behaviors for the temperature. But um, yeah, but assuming, and this is true for, for, for a long epochs, that G star is, is more or less constant, then you have uh, that the rate of change of the temperature is the rate of change of the scale factor. OK, so this one is exactly the, the main point, compare rates with the Hubble parameter. And I will just describe a very simple example. You, we maybe you will see it more in detail next week. I will do it very quickly in just one slide. And this is neutrino decoupling. So neutrinos, of course, uh, are only the um, electroweak interaction. So uh, for example, one way to keep in, uh, the, the neutrino in uh, equilibrium with the thermal bath is, of course, uh, through um, uh, the scattering with electrons or uh, the annihilation of neutrino into electrons. So, so we have the two processes, E plus or minus plus uh, neutrino, of course, or antineutrino, which goes into E plus or minus plus the neutrino or antineutrino. And we have also the other process, E plus, E minus, going into neutrino and antineutrino. OK? And all these processes go through the um, electroweak interaction. So uh, if you want, I can draw also the diagrams. Of course, you have the W exchange. And here you can have or, uh, the, uh, or the Z exchange. If it is a W, then of course, you have here E plus or minus, and here the neutrino or the antineutrino. 
and here uh, the neutrino or anti neutrino and you go to e plus or minus if you could have the z and then you would have uh, exactly the um, electron electron and neutrino neutrino and of course you have also for the annihilation you have the z channel so you have something like this and you have here e plus e minus going into neutrino and neutrino bar I don't write E, but this is the electron neutrino. Of course, you could do the same large game for the muon neutrino or the tau neutrino, but of course the electrons are those who remain in equilibrium longer because they are the lighter particles. Now, uh, you could compute the rates of these processes precisely. Of course, in the standard model, we know how to do it. Um, I will not actually do it. I will use just the Fermi theory for simplicity. And the Fermi theory tells me that this cross section for electron neutrino goes like the a weak coupling divided by uh, the Z mass to the four power times S. So the S in this case is not the entropy, is the S variable in scattering. So the center of mass energy x squared, if you want. So if you prefer, I can write the S, uh, sorry, let me write D squared. not to get confused with the entropy. Okay. And you see immediately it's a non-renormalizable coupling. Therefore, actually it's a cross-section with goals with the energy. So uh, you see that you have here uh, an energy square. So if you want to consider uh, the, uh, the thermal average, because of course what you want actually these rates I'm considering here, of course, is a kind of thermal average rate. And if I consider the thermal average rate, uh, I have to consider the thermal average rate times the velocity. Uh, we'll be clear in a minute, but the velocity is always in, uh, uh, in uh, units of C. So it is a most one. And in this case, the neutrinos are relativistic. So you can assume it is more or less one. And you see that if you do a thermal average here, uh, what, uh, what this energy gives you is actually the temperature. And moreover, when you want really to compute the rate, the rate is actually this cross section multiplied by the number density of the particle which are in the in the process. So in this case, I can I can take uh, the electrons, for example, but I, even if I take the neutrinos they are more or less the same. In this case, I'm neglecting the mass and I assuming they, they are, uh, yeah, let's say assume that they are practically uh, relativistic, which they are. And uh, I get uh, something which is then, so here is the average temper, uh, the average cross section. It is actually going like the coupling T to the fifth power. Okay. And you see that this makes exactly sense. This is a rate. So it should be uh, something one over time if you want, or if you want an energy. And uh, this t to the fifth divided by the mass to the fourth is gives you exactly one energy power, which is exactly in some sense what corresponds to a rate. And this is what you have to compare with the Hubble parameter. So we have to compare this gamma with uh, h. So and see what, when it is of the order of the Hubble parameter. And the Hubble parameter for this, I can use the expression I had before pi over three, the square root of g star over 10, and t square over the reduced Planck scale. And you see then immediately that if you do this computation, you have a relation. Uh, so you have, if you want, gamma over, So you have gamma over h equal to one correspond to a particular temperature. Uh, because if you do this ratio here, Hubble goes like t square, the gamma goes like t to the fifth power. So in total, you get something of uh, with the t cubed, the mass, the Planck scale and the z mass to the fourth. So uh, you see immediately from this relation, you can take out what is the temperature at which the neutrino decouples. And this is 
so the neutrino decoupling is a mz to the fourth power divided by alpha square w, the m Planck, reduced m Planck to the one third. And if you put in number, you find out that this is approximately uh, three MeV. Now, this one well, is a bit back on the envelope computation. In reality, if you do the computation more precisely, you get something like more 1.5 MeV, but uh, this is just to show you the basic idea. And of course, once I know that the particle has uh, decoupled, I can also assume uh, that I, uh, I can actually know what is the number density of the particle. Because in this case, the particle, uh, the mass of the neutrinos are all always much smaller than 3 MeV. So this means um, they decouple as a relativistic particle and their number density in some sense is fixed. So you see here that the only process which changes the number of neutrinos is this process here. And once this process doesn't happen anymore, the number of neutrinos in some sense is, is fixed. And here again, neglecting, of course, the chemical potential for the moment, uh, what we, you get out, if you would really compute uh, things, you, com you can compute the number density of neutrino and you find out that it's actually something like the sum, uh, of course, of the neutrino masses divided by 94 electron volts. Which, of course, is uh, uh, quite an old result, which was uh, obtained many years ago. And it shows you uh, that the neutrinos nowadays we know cannot really be uh, the dark matter because they are too light. They just contribute uh, to, to, to small amount uh, to the number density of the universe. I guess next week in the lecture about neutrinos, you will hear much more about this. So I don't want to uh, go much uh, further. Uh, the point is uh, that here I have described you uh, uh, again uh, a process, how, what would happen if I would, uh, if I decouple, especially at the temperature, which is much larger than the mass of the particle. If I do the couple at that uh, temperature, then of course the number density of the particle, uh, which is the decoupling, is exactly the uh, relativistic number density, and um, and uh, that is um, is in some sense a, a large number. Therefore, in some sense, usually in order to have um, the energy densities of order uh, omega h to the omega one, you need relatively small masses. But this is not the only possibility, and this was realized actually in the 70s. And I can go to the next uh, important uh, plot. This, in some sense, is, uh, is a plot which can show you giving us a particular cross section and a particular mass for the dark matter. What are the possibility for the number densities? So uh, we have seen that if we decouple, so we have the epoch uh, where uh, we have light and we decouple as a relativistic species. And if you, we decouple at relativistic species, the number density is given by the number density of a relativistic species, which depends on T to the cubed and not really on the mass. This means that the energy density will be just the mass times uh, the, uh, this uh, particular number density. So the, the curve will therefore grow linearly with the mass. And so it is proportional to the mass of the dark matter. And then for a particular value of the mass, of course, if I assume that there is a particular value which I want to get, 0 0.1, for example, which is the value, of course, we know the dark matter has, there will be a particular mass where I will hit the right value. Okay, and for the neutrinos we saw before is uh, something like 94 electron volts. But of course the number density uh, is uh, the non-relativistic uh, case. It's actually not uh, like the temperature cubed. So the number uh, density for non-relativistic species, we saw it before, is mt over two pi squared three half e to the minus m over t. 
This means that if the species in the, instead of uh, uh, freezing out or decoupling at uh, the relativistic epoch decouples later, so this curve will drop down at a certain point because at a certain point, the particle will start to decouple where it is uh, uh, relat re no relativistic. And this non-relativistic decouple, again, give you actually another value of the mass for which you would have exactly the right number density to be dark matter. And this non-relativistic decoupling is exactly what we nowadays call the WIMP mechanism, which I actually wanted to get to, but uh, yeah, we'll see how far I go today. And you see immediately that this mass is usually small, but this mass instead can be uh, also so quite large. Of course, um, yeah, we, how large it, it can be, we will discuss it in a minute, but it's, it can be around the electroweak scale, which is exactly what uh, people are, are looking for since, uh, since many years. Okay. And um, yes, so uh, what I wanted to do actually is now to uh, derive uh, the Boltzmann equation, which in some sense to describe this non-relativistic decoupling, you need a little bit more than just the argument I gave you here, because the argument I gave you here tells you when you decouple, but uh, it, it, in this case, it does tell you also what is the number density, just because in this case, the number density of the particle is not really depending on the mass of the particle. And it just, uh, it's, it's just a connected to the relativistic um, number of degrees of freedom, if you want, to the relativistic density. In the case when you decouple on this side, when you are in the non-relativistic decoupling, you need to, to be a little bit more careful. And there you need really to solve a Boltzmann equation to uh, find out what is the number density of the particle at the coupling. OK, and uh, this is uh, the next step. Which, of course, um, yeah, so let's hope. Oh, ah, it's really bad. I cannot add any page anymore. I didn't know I had a limit. It's the first time it ever happens to me to. OK, let me um, save it. And then I don't. I I guess I have to go out and open a new one. Yes, let me try. Okay, sorry for this. Unfortunately, then I will not be, ah, uh, no, I get exactly the same one. Oh, uh, this is really annoying. I have a limit on the number of pages. I never ever knew. Uh, let me see if I can do something. Uh, also, I have saved it. Of course, I could erase it now and start again, uh, but it would take me some time. So let me see if they have an, any solution. Of course, I have an empty page here, but it would not be enough. Let me see. Um, Okay, I have saved it, so hopefully, um, yeah, let me see where it is. Okay, sorry I, for that. I will move some of the slides somewhere else so that they are not lost, and then uh, we can uh, later um, try to, uh, I try to, to raise and then, because otherwise I will lose the notes. That's a little bit the unfortunate thing. Or oh, let me try to do something else. Um, Yeah, so next time I will, I will take care that I don't overshoot the number of pages. Um, uh, 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think I will just erase it. At, the, at this point, I can't really do much more. Uh, so I hope the notes will not get lost, uh, but um, clear all drawings. Yes, let me clear all drawings. Okay, I will start from scratch. Okay, so um, then in the last uh, quarter of an hour or so, let me um, really describe uh, how you derive the Boltzmann equation, which we need for solving uh, the problem. And of course, the Boltzmann equation, I hope uh, you all know the Boltzmann equation in uh, normal uh, statistical mechanics. So uh, the Boltzmann equation has usually this uh, form. You have a Liouville operator, and it gives you the evolution of the um, phase space distribution function. So you have a Liouville operator of the phase distribution function is equal to the collision integral of the phase distribution function. And the Liouville operator is actually what give you uh, the uh, free, if you want, uh, behavior of the, of the distribution. And this one instead is the collision integral. And the collision integral instead takes into account of all possible scatterings that you can have in your uh, or decays or any other process which changes, for example, the number of particle or changes the momentum of the particle. Instead, the Liouville operator is just the um, evolution, if you want, of the uh, distribution function without any interaction. Of course, in this case, it's not really true because we are in GR. So uh, some interactions, so in particular, the, the gravity interaction is included in some, if you want, in the UV operator. So uh, we can write the UV operator in GR uh, in a very simple form. You would have uh, this uh, P alpha D in the X alpha, where is the derivative of the spatial component. But then you have also a part which is connected to the, um, to the Christoffel symbols, and if you want covariant derivative with uh, two power of the momenta, and then the derivative on the uh, momenta. Okay. So this generic expression for the UV operator for a generic uh, Christoffel symbol. Of course, uh, in the case of the Friedman Roberts of Walker, the Christoffel symbols are pretty simple, and I can just give you the two which are relevant for us. So I have as gamma zero i i, which is nothing else as minus the Hubble parameter and g i i. And the other uh, interesting um, Christoffel symbol is the i i zero, which of course is equal to the one where you exchange the two indices. Here I'm taking the case where the, um, this is symmetric and this is just the Hubble uh, parameter. So if you plug this in in the expression, we find that the Liouville operator is uh, therefore just uh, P0, D0. Then you have uh, the P vector with the gradient. And then you have the gamma II times PII. So gamma 0, II, PI, PI, D in D, P0. And then you have uh, twice, because you have the two choices of indices here, and you get gamma i, i zero, p zero, p i, d in d p i. Okay? And this one you can again, um, if you want, uh, write uh, using this Hubble, uh, and also the fact that g i i I will take here, uh, in some sense, the case of uh, spatially flat universe. So GII is nothing else as the uh, Euclidean metric, if you want. So here I will get a P square. So, OK, let me clear that out as well. I have, therefore, P0, D0 minus P gradient minus H, so the P squared d d p zero and then i have twice h p zero dp with the 
gradient in P. But here, of course, there is a scalar. Uh, it's, a, it's the indices here are contracted. Now, of course, uh, this seems to be pretty complicated, but as already mentioned before, we can do some, uh, uh, some simplifications. Uh, so, um, so simplify. So of course, we have no dependence on the spatial component. So we will have uh, the gradient uh, of F uh, is equal to zero. And then we also can assume that F does not depend on the direction of the momenta. So, uh, so in that sense, F will be just a, a function of the, of the modulus of the momenta and not of the direction. And in that case, uh, we can drop this term and this term also simplifies um, the, uh, yeah, well, P gradient of P at uh, the end will, will uh, yeah, you can find out that actually uh, gives you um, zero. So at the end, we end up with the much simpler form. The UV operator is only the energy, which is P zero times D in DT. And then we have the second term H P square D in D E. And this is exactly uh, what you need to use in the friedman roberts walker And uh, so in that sense, uh, we have the equation, which is the first form of the equation I give you, df in dt minus h p df in de is equal to 1 over e, actually. Sorry, here I have to divide uh, is a p square, and I have to divide by e. And I have one over e, the collision integral. Because here I have divided by this e, OK? And yes, so this one is the, the formula I need to use. Now, uh, there is this second piece here, which has a, a p square over e d in the e. So in that sense, uh, you, I can uh, change this a little bit. And uh, um, yeah, so through uh, partial integration, because of course, at the end, what I want is actually the equation for the number density. So here is the equation for the distribution function f, which of course is the thing I, I could use uh, if I would be really interested in how the particle uh, is distributed in the phase space. But uh, at the end, uh, in the case of dark matter, the main important thing is the density, so the number density of the particle. And uh, so this means um, we can rewrite the equation for the number density, which is the integral, if you remember, of f. And now, of course, um, this means that in practice, you can integrate, if you want, the Boltzmann equation or the, the Liouville operator. So um, I can have a G integral in the 3P, and I can have the derivative DF in DT, and I have the second term, which we had before. Uh, divided by e. And then I have, uh, this is the, the part I have to consider. Now this part here, of course, you see immediately that I could also take the derivative out. So this gives me exactly the, the derivative. Let me take the total derivative, of course, because in this case, the number density depends only on time. So we have here, therefore, the dn in dt. And in the second part, I can try to do a uh, um, um, partial derivative and uh, integration, and uh, in some sense, uh, move the integral uh, in the other uh, so that I can get at the end uh, a simpler expression. And in particular, what I get, uh, I don't go through all details, I get actually a 3h uh, times uh, the n. And in that sense, this 3HN is nothing else as uh, the uh, dilution connected to the expansion of the universe, because you see immediately this 3H factor is exactly the same factor we had also 
yesterday for the density of uh, non-relativistic matter. So this is exactly is telling us that if there is no uh, interaction, the number density will be just uh, diluting the, like the uh, change in the volume. So uh, this would be, if you want, if the collision integral would be zero. So here I have a one over E, the integral of the collision integral, of course, sorry. No, the integral is before. Yes, so here I would have again G, the integral in D3P, the collision integral divided by E. Okay, so if the collision integral is vanishing, this would be equal to zero, and this would tell us the number density would just uh, go down like uh, the volume, one of the volume factor. Okay. But of course, we have usually a collision integral here, which changes uh, the discussion. Okay, so at the end, uh, this is the, uh, the form of the Boltzmann equation, which I will need uh, to consider. This is the following. So for the number density, I will have dn in dt plus 3hn is equal to the g, the integral in d3p over e, the collision integral. And now, of course, uh, the issue is what I have to put in this collision integral. Uh, if I am interested here in the processes, we change the number of particles. Of course, the only interaction here, which I or scatterings, which I have to consider, are scatterings which change the number of uh, particles. And this means that, uh, of course, um, you you could have a different type of processes. And usually, you start with the simplest processes or the processes with less number of couplings. So if you want uh, the uh, first thing you could put it is a decays. And decays, for example, would be assuming that this is the dark matter, the dark matter, for example, decay into a particle I and a particle J, that would be a two body decay. This of course would mean that the dark matter is not stable. And um, this is actually something we will uh, not really consider here, but we may consider later on uh, for other cases. So, um, so assume dark matter is stable. So neglect. So this one would be the simplest process, but of course the next uh, simpler process are the two to two scatterings. And the two to two scatterings would be, for example, dark matter, depending if the dark matter is a, um, a particle with an antiparticle or it's its own antiparticle, you could have dark matter, dark matter, or dark matter and anti dark matter going into, again, I, J particles. And uh, these are, of course, not elastic scattering. In principle, of course, if you have this process, you could also have the other process, dark matter plus particle A, I goes like to dark matter plus particle J. But uh, in that case, those uh, processes do not change the number of particles. So we do not need to take it, uh, in them into account in this, uh, in this expression, because they would cancel out. You have the, the, um, the rate in one direction and the rate in the uh, second direction, which would actually um, well, first of all, they will not change the number of particles, so they would contribute in some sense both positively and negatively to the collision integral. Okay, so um, this is the case I will discuss uh, now. And I see that I am already at the end of the lecture, so let me just write down uh, the uh, expression for the collision integral in this case. So we have the collision integral of the as a function of the dark matter density distribution. And this is practically nothing else as minus, I have the uh, integral on the other uh, states. So I have uh, an integral on the uh, dark matter, if you want the phase space of the dark matter, let me call it d pi for the dark matter bar 
I have a d pi for the particle i and a d pi for the particle j. Well, this d pi is the usual um, volume in the phase space. So d3p divided by 2 pi cubed. I have, of course, a conservation of the energy. So here I have, of course, p dark matter plus p dark matter bar in, in four. So if this is actually a, a, a delta function in, um, in all four components, minus pi minus pj. And then I have the uh, matrix element for the process. in one direction, weighted by the distribution of the dark matter. So here, in some cases, is the, uh, the erasing the number of dark matter. That's why I also have a minus here. And of course, I have also to consider the distribution of the final state particle, which if I want really to have a full uh, one to nature, so I have a 1 plus or minus Fie and 1 plus or minus Fj. And the uh, one is always connected to the, uh, well, for the bosons, of course, is the um, stimulated emission and for uh, the, uh, sorry, the spontaneous emission and the F is the uh, stimulated emission. And for the fermions, of course, uh, this is exactly what blocks uh, the uh, process in case there is already a particle occupying the, the particular space. And then, of course, I have the uh, process in the other direction where I have ij going into dark matter plus dark matter bar. And this one, of course, has a opposite uh, initial and final state. So here I have fi, fj, and here I have plus or minus f dark matter and one plus or minus f dark matter bar. OK. So this one is the generic form. And let me write just for uh, reference, d pi is nothing else as uh, uh, the number of degrees of freedom, uh, d3, uh, the momentum divided uh, two pi cube and twice the energy. OK, so this is the usual um, uh, element in the, in the momentum space that you have also in every uh, process also for computing cross sections. Okay, so I see that I arrived at the end of the lecture today. Unfortunately, um, there are still a couple of things I should discuss about this equation. I don't know if I can have five minutes more. Uh, yes, Laura. Yes, you can go on. Okay, so let me just finish this. Then tomorrow we will discuss the consequences, the physical consequences of the equation. But of course, this equation looks, again, uh, quite complicated. But there are a few simplifications we can do. And uh, this one are uh, the following. So again, a simplification. So one case is uh, consider a CP conservation, which uh, would mean that the two rates uh, the, for a process in one direction, or if you want a time reversal uh, conservation, but I assume CPT is, is, is a good symmetry. So. so this one squared is equal to the other. Uh, it's exactly the same matrix element as uh, the one for the inverse process. And then in some sense, I can uh, factor out this, uh, this factor. And I will call it actually just M squared. Then the other uh, a simplification is that I like, assume the i and j particles here are in equilibrium. So the dark matter can go out of equilibrium, but the i, j are in equilibrium. And uh, therefore, I can uh, directly write out uh, what is their, um, their uh, density and their uh, distribution function. Uh, in particular, um, I can uh, practically uh, use the form that fi fj I can substitute with f dark matter equilibrium and f dark matter bar equilibrium 
And this is uh, because um, the, the equilibrium density, um, it's again, um, in, in this sense, uh, doesn't, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, this will come in a minute, uh, but uh, we, will, uh, um, we will have uh, that the, the density is practically mostly uh, driven by the, by the exponential, if you want, dependence. So that uh, the F is, uh, this is also the what uh, we will assume, so um, that would mean a Maxwell Boltzmann. instead of uh, Fermi, Dirac, or Bose-Einstein. OK. And this, in exactly this approximation that we take actually Maxwell-Boltzmann instead of the uh, quantum distribution will also mean that we will also drop uh, these uh, F here, and uh, we will forget about uh, the uh, stimulated emission or the Pauli blocking. OK. And if this is the case, then we have the final result, uh, which means uh, that um, we have, therefore, that we can write the equation R as in this form. We have uh, uh, E minus uh, the integral in the, uh, of course, there is still an integral in the, uh, which I uh, didn't put in d pi, um, the dark matter density, which I didn't write before. And then we have the uh, pi of dark matter bar. But the other uh, integrals um, I can put together. So here I have the distribution of dark matter with the distribution of dark matter bar minus the equilibrium one. And then I have uh, the, uh, the other integral, which is actually in the final state, if you want, in some sense. Of course, in principle, I have the processes in all two directions. Uh, and here I have the matrix element square, the delta function, I don't write all the p's, and uh, and uh, these all together is nothing else as exactly what I usually call a cross section. So this is nothing else as x sigma dark matter dark matter bar into i j multiplied by the velocity. Okay. So you see that I have reduced the things in the expression for, um, for the cross section. And uh, the other thing I have to still to do, which I uh, see now I probably not able to, is to do the, the last assumption about the form of this F function. If the F function is just a rescaled equilibrium uh, function, which uh, I will probably then do tomorrow, then we have uh, the final simplification, and I am able to resubstitute this f with the number density again, so that I can write an equation which is only a function of the number density. And just I give you the form of the equation, just for. And tomorrow I will explain uh, the last step. But what we have is the following equation, which is the one we will study to tomorrow. Sorry, not X, of course, this is the dark matter. Uh, and that is the last uh, step or the last thing I do today. Minus, I can write it, the average, thermal average of the cross section. Times the difference in the number densities. And this is the final equation. So here, let me write dark matter in again. OK. So let me finish here. Um, I Yes, I am a little bit uh, uh, slower than I thought. I wanted to discuss also the physics of this equation today. 
but it will be also part of the exercises and um, in some sense, um, we will go into the detail tomorrow to see exactly what uh, is the solution and how uh, does uh, this uh, give me uh, practically the number density which we want for dark matter. Okay, thanks, Laura. This is time maybe for a few questions. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. So the um, relation that you wrote before, this thing of Fi times Fg equal to Fx dark matter in previous, yes, this one, um, is it obvious or I don't clearly see where it come from, comes from? Well, it's not obvious, especially if you would have the Fermi-Dirac or the Bose-Einstein distribution, because of course you could have I J being bosons and the in dark matter being fermion or vice versa. But this is, um, is, is the assumption that uh, I can use actually something simpler like the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution in the momentum space is just the exponential minus E over T multiplied by some, uh, if you want, also some degrees of freedom. And uh, in this case, you can see that uh, it doesn't really matter if it is a boson or a fermion. So the fact if you multiply these two together, here you have just uh, exponential of minus the total energy dividing temperature. And of course, the total energy at the final state is the same as the total energy in the initial state. So you can uh, easily uh, see that there is this equivalence. I see, I see. I, I didn't think about energy conservation. OK, thanks. Yes, it is due also to energy conservation, of course. Any more question? Uh, yes. Can I uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Um, so, if I understand this correctly, we is essentially assume that the dark matter is in some thermal path or in thermal equilibrium with two other particles. But uh, what kind of interactions can cause this? Because I thought we required dark matter to be very weakly interacting in general, at least with the forces we with strong force and. Uh, Electromagnetic well, force. Interaction could play the game. So that's why I described you the example of the neutrino. So the neutrino, in some sense, is a kind of prototype uh, dark matter uh, in the old days. It was mm -hmm. at least uh, what inspired many of these uh, considerations. So the idea here would be to use a heavier neutrino. Okay. And uh, in that sense, uh, that, that is exactly what I was trying to show you in this plot here. Um, this actually is what people did uh, quite some time ago. This is a famous Lee Weinberg bound. So here in practice, if you would have a heavier neutrino which stays here and the, the Lee and Weinberg in the old days computed in some sense what is the minimal mass because you see here in between you see that you have a density uh, energy density which is too large which would already close the universe. And they, uh, at that time, discussed mostly the limits, uh, saying that the neutrino, if you have such a heavy neutrino, it has to be heavier than a few GeV. OK, OK. But I of course, it. if it would be exactly in this point, this neutrino of a few GeV would exactly be the right dark matter candidate. I see, and I see. Of course, nowadays, we don't think about neutrinos anymore. There are some arguments why neutrinos don't work. Actually, they are already excluded by direct detection because neutrinos couple to the Z boson relatively strongly. Mm -hmm. So um, they would actually already have shown up if that would be the case. Uh, but uh, you could have other particles for which the same mechanism works and the, um, the interaction could be the weak interaction, um, a bit weaker than the neutrino case. But it could be something else, of course. And this is what we try to, I will try to give an example tomorrow. But okay. of course, it, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of possibilities, so. I see, yeah, okay, thank you.